debates with Christians regarding the practice of slavery, we hear a lot of revisionist history and apologetic flim-flam, but no matter how they twist and squirm, one thing is clear. The Bible does not condemn slavery. In Exodus 1, Yahweh seems a little grumpy about the harsh treatment of his pet tribe, the Israelites, by their Egyptian slave masters, but even there, the practice of slavery is not condemned. Every biblical passage which speaks directly about slavery is at best a tacit approval of the practice. The Bible gives instructions on who to own, how long you can own them, how to trick a fellow Hebrew into permanent enslavement, and how severely to beat slaves, but never condemns owning another human as property. In Leviticus we read, You may purchase male or female slaves from among the foreigners who live among you. You may also purchase the children of such resident foreigners, including those who have been born in your land. You may treat them as your property, passing them on to your children as a permanent inheritance. You may treat your slaves like this, but the people of Israel, your relatives, must never be treated this way. Now, despite the caveat in that last verse, there is a loophole in Exodus to allow for permanent enslavement of Hebrew slaves as well. If you buy a Hebrew slave, he is to serve for only six years. Set him free in the seventh year, and he will owe you nothing for his freedom. If he was single when he became your slave and then married afterward, only he will go free in the seventh year. But if he was married before he became a slave, then his wife will be freed with him. If his master gives him a wife while he was a slave, and they had sons or daughters, then the man will go free in the seventh year, but his wife and children will still belong to his master. But the slave may plainly declare, I love my master, my wife, and my children. I would rather not go free. If he does this, his master must present him before God, then his master must take him to the door and publicly pierce his ear with an awl. After that, the slave will belong to his master forever. As for how to properly abuse slaves, Exodus says, Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But they're not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two, since the slave is their property. One annoying and patently dishonest apologetic is the claim that slaves in the Bible were just indentured servants. Holy crap! In Job, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, and other books, the Bible makes clear distinctions between servants and slaves. So when a Christian redefines slave to simply mean indentured servant, <laughs> they may as well rewrite the Ten Commandments as the Ten Suggestions. Matt Dillahunty has done a fabulous job of destroying those deceitful apologetics. I've included a link for more from him in the description. The bottom line is, if the all-loving, all-powerful, biblical God actually disapproved of slavery, he should have said so. It could have been the 11th commandment, don't own people as property. Rather, the Abrahamic God actually includes slaves in the list of property not to covet in the 10th commandment. Do not cover your neighbor's house, do not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female slave, his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Some apologists say it was a different time and suggest that denouncing slavery would have been just too great a shock to the barbaric tribes of antiquity. Now even if that argument had any merit, which it doesn't, God could have at least phased it out over a few generations. There is simply no justification to let the practice continue for thousands of years. But it's actually much worse than that. After the flood, when there was supposedly only Noah and his family on the entire planet, 
the Bible indicates that through Noah, God actually decreed slavery. The story goes like this. Noah, the only man on all the earth whom God deemed worthy to be spared from his genocidal tantrum, got so drunk that he passed out naked, and his son Ham accidentally saw his junk. So Ham got his brothers, Shem and Japheth, to walk backward with a cloak and cover their dad's naughty bits. Then when Noah awoke and realized his son might have spied his wiener, he decreed that Ham's son, Canaan, Noah's grandson, would henceforth be a slave to his brothers and uncles. Genesis lays it out. He said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. He also said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Japheth's territory. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be the slave of Japheth. Yeah, I know, it makes no sense. But hey, it's the Bible. When confronted with biblical reference regarding slavery, a common apologetic dodge is to switch the argument and say that it was Christians who led the abolitionist movement at the time of the American Civil War. Well, no shit. The entire country was Christian at that time. There was simply no one else around to do it. The fact that people who happened to be Christian led the abolitionist movement is irrelevant. Christians had the previous 18 centuries in which they could have addressed the problem. The fact is, scripture was not on their side. In the next video, we'll review one of the most influential documents supporting the biblical endorsement of slavery, written at the time of the Civil War, by a Southern Baptist minister. Now, if you're a Christian, who claims that the God of Abraham did not endorse slavery, either you simply don't know your Bible, or... Error, 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 error.